have Shannon Fox. She's a graduate of the University of California, Santa Barbara, with a degree in aquatic biology and a University of Maryland master's in environmental management, and has worked as a research biologist for the past 10 years. I started studying sharks because I find them fascinating. They're one of the oldest living animals on our planet, and from an evolutionary standpoint, where they've gotten as a predator is unreal. And they're the big dogs in the ocean, so every ecosystem is pretty intricate wrapped around them. So if you're fascinated in the ocean, it's always good to look at its predators. Her areas of research have included krill, zooplankton, southwestern willow flycatcher, corals, and sharks. Shannon has worked with South African Shark uh, Conservancy, Okinawa Ocean Club, and Arabic Elasmo Project in helping to develop research and conservation programs for students. I started studying sharks because I find them fascinating. They're one of the oldest living animals on our planet, and from an evolutionary standpoint, where they've gotten as a predator is unreal. And they're the big dogs in the ocean, so every ecosystem is pretty intricate wrapped around them. So if you're fascinated in the ocean, it's always good to look at its predators. Sharks, I went down to South Africa and worked for a research group down there. And after finding out all the research potential and some of the amazing things that sharks can do, I became addicted to them and started to do presentations and education programs directed at dispelling a lot of the myths against and about sharks. What kind of myths? Oh, that sharks are super aggressive, they just go out and bite people, and a billion people a year are killed by sharks. Those are, those are all absolutely ridiculous. Sharks are typically very afraid of people and do their best to stay away from divers in the water and people in the water. Shannon develops field studies programs for international students in Southeast Asia covering geography, wetlands, coastal ecosystems, habitat degradation, conservation, and sustainable growth. Her topic tonight is gonna to be on sharks, research and con conservation. I mean, you have all these ideas of sharks as these brainless, mindless killers, and that's not the case. So that was probably my favorite thing to learn about sharks and actually when interacting with them. So let's give a big round of applause for Shannon Fox. It's always interesting hearing about yourself. <laughs> um, I really appreciate everybody who came out tonight. I just got back to Ireland two days ago and I've been wanting to go to one of Sean's presentations since he started doing them. And I have not made one, so obviously my first time here will be presenting one. So hope you guys are all excited to hear about sharks. Um, what I want to go over today actually is going to start with the research projects that I've actually worked on with sharks. And I know this is a photography group, but I also know it has a lot to do with diving and scientific interests. So I'm going to kind of cover all those bases in this presentation. The top one is Bruv. It's a baited remote underwater video recorder. And what that is, is it's basically a GoPro. And that's what it does. And it's pretty much revolutionized our ability to look underwater and explore marine protected areas to see what's actually happening under there. And because GoPros have been made really affordable, it's greatly helped with research. I'm going to go over cage diving and tourism. That was a facet of my work in South Africa, was actually training cage diving operators on basic anatomy, rundown of sharks, and also being able to do proper sighting, observation recordings, and tagging. Should be a bed for wise. I'm going to go over some bull shark tagging and tracking. This was a program that was run out of the Breda River. I know bull sharks get a bad reputation, but they're pretty fascinating. And the Breda River Project has a lot to do with showing that bull sharks actually come back to the area that they're born in, which is very similar to salmon. And that's a current theory that they're working through since they're having recurring the same sharks are coming back year after year and using the same river as a nursing ground, which goes a long way with helping design proper management techniques for conserving those areas. And I'm going to go over angling competitions with recreational fish South Africa. 
And what that was was actually going out to angling competitions that were catch and release and doing all the data work up on a shark before putting it back into the water. This was tagging, total length, assessment on body mass, getting genetic sampling, and then actually walking the shark back into the water. That's what we're going to cover today. The BRUB, the Baited Remote Underwater Video Recording. You basically design a rig and attach a GoPro to it. Based on what you want to target is the bait that you actually put into the canister. I actually had a baited, uh, had a rig here that I gave to Gary Hughes when I left the island, but I don't, he was actually able, able to utilize it. But what it does is it enables you to actually see underneath the water, and yes, you're baiting the animals, so you're going to see certain interactions and certain animals that are aggressive for food, so that does change the dynamic of what you're actually observing. That is something you have to take into account. But it also enables you to sight an animal that maybe you didn't know was in the area, which helps with setting up reserves if you're starting to see great white sharks cruise through an area that they're not usually seen at. The video I selected to show you how, how the rigs set up and how they work is actually one that my friend Lauren DeVos did. And she's been one of the big pioneers in utilizing this equipment and making videos that the public can see what's going on underwater. So without further ado, let's play Shane with the If any video clip is going to give you an idea of what false bay looks like when it's pea green, this is probably the video clip to do it. You can definitely still see fish in the frame, and I think that's a puff out of shy shark swimming back into the distance there. Some fish get the right idea immediately about where the food is at, and others might just be attention seekers. Keeping a sharp eye is definitely a must when analysing data in this kind of poor visibility. Did anyone see that smooth hound shark gliding past? Of course, a test deployment would be incomplete without another visit from an octopus. I've sped up the footage once more so that you can see just how long it took this octopus to figure out how it would remove the entire bait canister from our camera rig. This means that this octopus had to figure out how to undo three cable ties to remove the bait canister. Keep an eye on the pajama cat shark that tried to get to the bait canister and was kept firmly in its place by the octopus pretty much the entire time. pajama cat shark that hadn't learnt its lesson from the octopus. And the persistent presence of some stankies who insisted on taking their limelight in front of the camera. So what that is, is setting up this rig and leaving it there. And then by the time you pull it up, you have no idea what's happened or what animals have come up, or what's gone on with the bait. And to get footage like that, where you have a octopus that is holding a shark by its fin while it undoes all of your hard work putting those cable ties on the bait canister and actually undoing the cable ties and taking the entire bait canister with it. So when Lauren brought the ray, uh, when she brought it back up to the surface and there's no bait canister, you obviously know that something has happened during that data, during that set. It's pretty amazing, the footage it can capture. And you can go to YouTube and look up any grub 
video work, and it'll show there's times where the great white shark has actually taken off with the breath and gone for a swim, and then they go to retrieve it, and the buoy's kind of completely in place. Um, there's a lot of sea lions. There's ones that are designed to stay within the water column, trying to get schools, um, camera heads. I mean, most places now use them, and based on what they're going for, like the lights over there, getting a dark rig set up. And it's the easy way to, you get a data set, you look at the video and you record interactions, observations, species, how long they stayed, what they ate, what they interacted with, and that's the reporting that you get for that, and that's your data set that you work from from there. And you can build a good conservation plan knowing what's actually come into the area and what it's done in the process. Cage diving and tourism. You guys are going to quickly see that I am not a videographer. Um, nor a photographer. But when I went down to South Africa, I had gone, worked with them for five years. So I've gone down twice and stayed a month and a half each time, and then in the process I'll do other programs and run other shark education programs here in Okinawa in the States, uh, and in the Middle East as well. And this one with cage diving, you go in and working at the research facility, people always ask you what's your opinion of it. How do you think it's actually impacting the sharks? And you come to find out that it's incredibly regulated. They're not actually allowed to feed the sharks whatsoever. So the sharks don't start associating the food that they've been fed with the boats or with people. Uh, the chum slick that they put out behind the sharks is actually comprised of anchovies and uh, like chemical oil. It's not actually comprised of any real blood. It's all mineral salt. And, I don't know, has anyone here about cage diving? So what you come to quickly find out is they'll give you an overview of the shark, their life history, and a lot of these sharks breeze through the area. They don't stay long. This is typically one sighting, an interaction for maybe an hour, and then they continue up the coast. Where I went cage diving was Dyer Island, which is where they film shark eating. And the reason that shark eating is filmed there is there's two islands with population of sea lions that swim in the middle of it, and then when they have to go out and branch out, that's when all the great white sharks are in the area as well. So I'm going to show you my uh, excellent skills at filming when I'm too excited to do it properly.
super excited to be cage diving and the first really good shots of the shark, the GoPro went up on my wrist and did not come back down. And I didn't notice that until I went to actually look at the video footage. Um, what you find too, if you ever go cage diving is being in that corner and in the first group is the best place because your back is to the boat and you've got a view underneath and you've actually got your own corner. So that shark that went by the very last time actually clipped the side of the cage. What they're doing is, as you notice, there's no tanks. Great white sharks actually don't hang around with tanks very often. That's a lot of additional noise. So jokingly, and you can edit this out, I used to call it a hold your breath and be yourself. <laughs> because all of a sudden there's a giant great white shark in front of you. And what they're doing on top of the cage is they're throwing a tuna head over you. And that's what that line is. Because what they're doing is they're throwing the shark out, the head of the tuna out, and then they're pulling it directly to the cage. So that way the shark goes after the tuna head and heads straight to the cage. In the video I said that that shark got lucky. That's actually not the case. That was a female great white shark. And she had actually been trying three or four different angles to get the tuna head. So what she finally discovered is that if she came directly up, instead of trying to cruise in on the side, they wouldn't be able to see her. And what you find out about great white sharks is that the females are the largest. And they're also more intelligent. They have a little bit more brain mass than their male counterparts. So she had actually been sorting out how to get the bait. It is illegal to feed them, but in low visibility conditions, obviously there was no way to see her come directly up to get the fish head. Again, part of the observations is reporting which sharks have tags. They're looking for any identified features of the sharks, and those are all things that get reported and become a way to track when the sharks have been sighted around the island. I'm going to head into bull sharks now, since we covered our great white sharks cage diving. Uh, the Brita River is a river at the very bottom of South Africa, and it is a large river system. It's a very popular spot for recreational fishing. It is also the home to Yami Yami, who is a male bull shark that uses it as her nursery ground. There's never been an attack in the Brita River, but the sharks use it as a nursery ground. But it was only discovered within the last, I think I started doing this research about 10 years ago, that the bull sharks used it and were in the river as frequently as they were. Bull sharks, each shark has different bait that they go for. Each shark has a different uh, food that they consume. With bull sharks, it has to be alive, it has to be thrashing, and it has to be bleeding in order to a shark in order to catch a shark. So the way that she was caught was that way. So generally biologists go out and they start from the bottom. Uh, the head on this project was Megan before in Tamsin's side. And they went out and collected from the bottom out, starting with mudworms, and built up to catch the next level of fish, to catch the next one after that, to catch the top fish that they would then mirror to catch the bull shark. And they actually did have to stab the fish, so it was thrashing on the line and threw it into the water with a blood trail to get the bull sharks to actually the fish off the line. Why would you think that bull sharks would get such a bad reputation if they really like bleeding fish? In a river system, it's like a supermarket. They're like, okay, sweet, there's no other major predator in here, and all these fishermen are catching fish and bringing them to the boats. The bull shark, it's just easy eating. They're like, okay, sweet blood, fish is struggling, chomp. Fishermen are not fans. So the bull shark actually gets a really bad reputation largely because it is a shark that is competitive with fishermen. So Nyami Yami is not an easy catch. Uh, we have anglers that work with the group and actually you can see the landing is that far up the river, and I'll show you a scale of how far that is, so that's the tributary. Between zero and five hours after she was caught, she starts heading back out the river channel and into the coastal surge area. What's known about sharks is that they have to swim to get oxygen. Well, if a shark is in distress, the easiest place for it to get oxygenated water is in the break, the 
which is why they're so commonly found in waves, which is why they hang out with surfers. Usually it's a shark that's in duress, and this is an easy place to go and breathe and not have to work for it. So the bull shark, after being caught, they back out the river and went and hung out in the breakwater to reoxygenate before heading back up the river. These sharks, bull sharks are very intelligent. They know the tide flows. They go out, the tide's going out, they come in, and the tide is going in. They're not going to fight their way out into a river that's metabolically exhausting. They also go into rivers because they can, but they're not the only shark that can go into rivers. They are one of the largest, and they're very competitive for their food within the river system, which is, again, why fishermen are not huge fans of them. So Yami Yami went 32 kilometers up river uh, based on the satellite tag that was attached to her. And again, this was all following the tide going in, 32 kilometers up, tide going back out. And you can see where she spent the duration of her time was about 11 to 15 kilometers up. Well, Yami Yami had kids. And I don't know if you recognize this guy, but it's Jeremy Wade, apparently. He's the star of uh, River Monsters. Well, they saw the project, and they saw that this bull shark was caught in the Britta River. So Jeremy Wade funded the next trip, and funded the next round of satellite tags, and came out to catch his very own bull shark, which was Pumpkin. So that's Pumpkin, which you know. And when you can see the fish that the bull shark took a bite of up in that corner. Yeah, it's five fish in there. Pumpkin was caught with that group of river monsters, and the genetics were done on the sharks. And yes, Yami Yami is a mother to Pumpkin. So Pumpkin had come back to the river, used the same river where he was born, and they found him a year later in that same place. What's even crazier about Pumpkin is that you put the satellite tags on and they're pop-off tags. So at some point, they either come up with them, shoot up to the satellite, see where they are, or the tags occasionally fall off. Pumpkins fell off and was found, so you thought the worst. Except a year later, he was caught again in the same river, same time, same, same everything. Except before his satellite tag popped up, Pumpkin went up the coast of Mozambique, which has about 10 fisheries that he went by. And when they caught him the following year, he had probably 15 fishing hooks stuck into his mouth. So Pumpkin wasn't necessarily the brightest of sharks um, mm -hmm. swimming up the coast of Mozambique. But again, he came back the following year. And they call it, elopatry is the tendency of an organism to stay in or habitually return to a particular area. And there's a lot of reasons for that, and they're trying to find out what would drive a shark to do that. It's very similar to salmon, but if you think about it, salmon also have a very similar life cycle where they bring the freshwater system and they go out to the ocean for their adult part of their life. But this hadn't really been thought of as a potential for sharks as well. The other word to think of is phylogeography, and that's the study of the same genetics coming from the same place. So the family is using the same area. And all the bull sharks out of the Britta River have the same genetics. They're all a family unit that come back from the same area. And this research is ongoing. So they just had their field study a month ago. But again, it's continually getting data. It was surprising enough to find the bull shark in the Britta River, let alone that it's a continually occurring thing and that it's a generational thing as well. Wreck fish South Africa. Up in the corner, that's a bronze whaler or a bronzy. They have a big festival where they go. The entire length of the beach is covered in anglers and each one has a fish and wildlife department employee with them a volunteer shark enthusiast and a shark researcher. And what they do is they actually will catch a shark. And there's a timeline, and it's for an award, they get points for it. But in that timeline, they get their one trophy picture when they get it to shore, and then we've got about three minutes before we need to get it back into the water. Because we're not flipping them, we're not aerating them, we're trying to keep the levels of lactic acid that builds up on the sharks under us low. The time on the line is also very important. So when you catch a shark, you want to keep time on the line low as well, so that way they don't get any further damage than being caught. It works well because it's a catch and release. Obviously, when you're catching sharks, but you get 
all of our shark catches, a lot of our research, we need anglers to work with us to catch the sharks that we need to research and study, tag and release, and anglers know what they're doing, know how to handle the sharks, and know what the objectives are. Damaging a shark doesn't get us our goals. They're very good with it. Probably the most interesting part of this is the walking the shark back out into the water. And you can see the fishermen standing there. Most shark attacks happen in less than three feet of water. So they're pretty impressive guys on the whole. But they've helped with the bronze whaler. They help with the smooth hound shark as well, which is one of those that's currently up for sites in the good species listing. And one of the things that South Africa is building to continue to make conservation areas for. Uh, the guy that's walking the shark back into the water, he's a professional alligator handler, and this was his first shark. So he did a really, really good job. Education. So I kind of went over the big research projects I worked on and collected data and helped with. A lot of what I've done since then has been educational. Uh, with South African Shark Conservancy, obviously in class we do a lot of stuff with kids. We have sharks on site so kids can see us feed sharks. We have meetings that the public can attend. They can touch the sharks, they can hold them. We have sharks to dissect and we do run classroom programs out of there. This one was a group of troubled students out of Cape Town that they brought out to Stoke Potter and we actually ran an entire camp for them out there. It was my first time seeing a Mola Mola, which actually got stuck in a tide pool. Pretty much. Um, this group is run out of Save Our Seas. So Save Our Seas is one of the big activists for shark research, and they did promote a lot of that wreck fish South Africa was funding from Save Our Seas as well. Gulf Alaska Project was working in the Middle East, and Rima Jabato is one of the females that works at the ministry and she is the doctor in charge of education. The Middle East is kind of a mess, but uh, with sharks, a lot of their identification sheets are wrong. So a big part of what we did out there was going to dive shops and actually educating dive instructors and dive staff to identify sharks in the wild. And it was a component called citizen science. And it was actually teaching people how to cite sharks, how to record it, and how to get viable data that could be brought back, that could be used to show the entire area. With this area, there's a lot of construction along the coast of the UAE, and a lot of that is mangrove area. The actual natural mangroves left are almost non-existent. And the sharks that use that area, like guitar fish, uh, things like that, are almost gone, and there's very little regulation or restriction on the fishing market. So in that corner, you can see that's actually the fish market that was three blocks from where I lived. And that was a daily haul. It was usually anywhere between 20 to 50 sharks. And it's not a thinning thing, it's just that is what they're catching. Sharks are not a healthy food choice. They're an apex predator. The mercury loading that happens with tuna actually happens to a higher degree in sharks because, again, the amount of higher level food that they're eating like tuna, all that mercury bioaccumulation goes straight into the sharks as well. And since sharks can be scavengers as well, you're getting a lot of microplastics, so it's actually probably one of the least healthy food options out of the ocean to actually eat shark meat. Uh, the whale shark actually cruises through that area as well. And they have a migration path in the Middle East. And that's another animal that they do a lot of sightings on. And that was actually my first time diving with a whale shark, was just at a safety stop. Shark meat for kids. Um, since I've done all these programs and since I started to learn about sharks and realizing that kids automatically assume sharks are going to eat them, I started to run a lot of shark week programs and it covered biodiversity in sharks, it covered anatomy, it covered the differences between a bony fish, or a teleos, and cartilaginous fish. I enabled kids to do dissections. I also taught them a huge amount about biodiversity. So most of the kids when I ask them what their favorite shark is or what sharks do they know, it's great white shark, bull shark, tiger shark, the spotted one, the whale shark, and the one with the crazy teeth, which would be the goblin shark. Um, and they also think the megalodon's alive, so we can thank Sharknado for that. 
Um, and then I try to redirect them towards the mega mouth, which is an actual living shark and the second largest shark on the planet. The programs were geared to teach about shark biodiversity. Uh, it's a program I actually really like to, I really enjoy doing. I did a lot of career days, did a lot of school presentations here on island, and I actually ran a shark week out of the Indian Youth Center. Was something that the Air Force actually funded and ran programs for. I'm going to show you one of the videos I would show the kids talking about shark biodiversity. I really, really like the shy sharks. Um, how many of you have heard of a donut shark? Or a shy shark? It's a super fun and friendly shark that <laughs> happened to have on our uh, staff. Sometimes the fir first shark you go to ship, oh, you're not capable of catching. But don't give up, just grab the next one hiding underneath. state of being unique to a defined geographic location, such as an island, a nation, or other defined zones or habitat types. Organisms that are indigenous to a place are not endemic to it if they are also found elsewhere. So when an animal is endemic to an area, it means that it's unique to that area. Because they're both you can see the spherical there on the side of his head. That's what they used to breed out of. They use it to draw water out of the gills here. This one actually has a parasite on the gill. Sometimes they get it on the gills and also on the fins. I've seen them there too. Really pretty eyes. This one. When you hold them upside down, some sharks go into a state called chronic immobility, where they lie there and they can be wrecked until they're released, kind of like a pet excuse me. He has a parasite on the tip of his head. This one's a little boy. <laughs> the puff adder shy shark is the species of cat South Africa. This common shark is found on or near the bottom in sandy or rocky habitat from the inner tidal zone to a depth of 130 meters. Quite common within its small range, this sluggish and reclusive puff adder shy shark is often seen lying still on the sea floor. It is gregarious and several individuals may rest together. Gregarious means likes to hang out with its buddies. So how many sharks can you count? I guess the best 
Christmas present we could give to the sharks? What us to release them while we all went home for the holidays? So here we are bringing our pup adder and our dark shy sharks <laughs> down to the ocean to release them. <laughs> This one even manages to get one last no scratch. Take care, dude. So I like showing kids that video because it has a group of socialized sharks. Like you've got a group of sharks hanging out together and a shy shark turns into a donut when it's afraid. That's its reactionary mechanism. So you have this idea of these killer giant sharks, but out of the 500 plus species of sharks, you're looking at maybe less than 2% that actually interact with humans on any dangerous level. Most that you get are the endemics, the small kelp sharks, swell sharks, squallings, deep sea sharks, and sharks that you're never going to see. And the donut shark's super cute. They'll stay like that for a while. <laughs> One of the nice things, <coughs> so the Okinawa Aquarium has hosted probably 200 plus American students to come into the research center and do behind the scenes work with their scientists. And these students were actually able to do a shark dissection and they brought up some of the deep sea shark species. The Okinawa Trench that runs the length of Okinawa has species of sharks that have never been identified. And actually the goblin shark was discovered off the coast of Japan as well. So its actual name is Japanicus because of last name. The kids were able to see chimeras, goblin sharks, some of the bioluminescent sharks, the ones that produce their own light, a spookfish, and a ratfish, which are cartilaginous species that hadn't actually been identified. So they've always hosted us, always been able to bring up students, and they'll usually do a dissection, and they'll bring out usually 20 specimens for the kids to see in different jaws, things like that, that they always have on hand within the research center to use in cases like this. Uh, Gary Hughes actually came with me on a shark week that I ran in October. So I am going to show you the behind the scenes video that they did and that he put together that has the shark dissection. The other thing that they do is they let us go above for the feeding. So you can actually see the whale sharks feed, the manta rays feed. The reason that they don't do that with the general public anymore is that two and a half years ago, one of the whale sharks died. And what they found when they did the autopsy was that actually it swallowed a plastic bag. So that somebody had dropped a plastic bag into the tank, the whale shark had eaten it, stopped eating, and then died. And that happens. But that shows just how vulnerable the whale sharks are to whatever is in the water. I mean, it's not like us where if we eat something that we're gonna choke on, we can just grab it and take it out of our mouths. Like they can't spit it up. It's a vacuum, it's in there, it stays. So that's why they no longer allow the general public up there to do those programs, but they will still host us on occasion. And the kids are well instructed not to throw anything <laughs> over the edge and to stay away from the side. But it is <laughs> incredibly good of them that they still have us go up and do these programs. So for a shark to have this liver full of oil, that's amazing. 
That is one of the reasons why they can live in the deepest parts of the ocean. here to learn all about sharks. I love talking about sharks. You're never going to ask me a question that I don't want to hear. I want to hear them all.
cruise, but the whale sharks are on one side and the manta rays on the other. They've been trained to do that because the whale sharks are a little less intelligent than the manta rays. And when they try to put them in a group, the whale sharks would bulldoze the manta rays. So the manta rays have learned to feed second and to feed on this side in a circle. And that way the large male whale shark doesn't actually like accidentally pull them over. So he gets fed first and then the female gets fed second and then the third whale shark goes. They actually have an order in which they feed the largest going first and the ones following after that. One of the things that's also not well advertised about the aquarium is that it has one of the most successful breeding programs of manta rays in the world. So the manta rays that are in the tank have actually all been born there. And generally what they do is every year in May, at some point this month, another manta ray will be born. So manta rays have one offspring once a year. And generally the one that happens in the aquarium, you can have it on the right day, you can see it. And it happens in the tank, the manta ray is six feet long, wingspan wise, when it's born. It's rolled up like a Tootsie Roll, and then it comes out in like a cloud of milk, because manta rays actually feed their young in the womb with a milk sack. And then it instantly starts swimming behind. So the manta rays that they have in there now is actually one of the babies that was born last year. And for the first month, you could tell the size difference, and then they're about how long so it is one of those continually uh, population that's self-sustaining. On when you walk into the aquarium, there's a wall, and it actually has every one of their successful breeding programs. Last year, the Okinawa Aquarium hosted the Alaska Brank Symposium. Uh, and it's the filter feeding Alaska Brank Symposium, which means your whale sharks, your megamouths, basking sharks, with a touch of manta rays in there as well. And what the director, the founder of the aquarium said is that at one point they would like to successfully breed a whale shark. So for a long time, they've been trying to get one of their juveniles to mature. But the Okinawa Aquarium typically only keeps juveniles because of the size constraints of the tank. But up until 2002, we didn't actually know how we would shark. How they were born, and it's only because a Taiwan fishing vessel caught a whale shark and cut it open and it happened to be a pregnant female that we became aware of how they actually hatched, how many, and how they were born. So the aquarium is trying, was trying to do that two years ago, so it's one of the reasons why their largest whale shark has been in there for so long, is they're trying to actually get it to a mature age. Most sharks have a really long timeline, they have a really long history, and they don't mature very easily. <coughs> I think with whale sharks, it's like between it's nine years before they reach like six maturity. It could actually be longer than that. Why have sharks become such a target of fear? And actually, you can see the decline of sharks with the movie Jaws as that sounds. And it's not that all of a sudden the increase for shark fin soup came on the rise, it just it became more acceptable to kill sharks and blamed a lot of that on fear. One of the other things that happened too was it became a trophy. Unfortunately, the great white shark, like I said before, the largest shark is the female. So if you're killing off your largest an oldest female for a trophy or killing off your best producer. Which is another reason why the shark species, a lot of them began to decline, is because target hunting for the largest trophy, the largest mouth, the largest catch, you're targeting females of the species. And not only females, but the longest living females and your best producers. Actually, Peter Benchley has <laughs> stated in later years that he would have the right day for fiction book based on the species again and he's actually donated millions of dollars to try and to 
right and wrong to go into ocean conservation and protecting these species. The other thing is, too, is that sharks have some of the longest gestational periods <laughs> species on the planet. The frilled shark gestates for 42 months before it gives birth, and that's it's really hard to design a fisheries study and management practice when we have shark species that take anywhere from 20 months to 42 months to give birth. And that doesn't even mean that it's giving birth to a plethora. It means that sometimes it can be three to six to nine to one in the case of an or two. There is a shark <coughs> video. Uh, based on the internet, I don't quite think I'm going to play it, but I mean, it's really easy to get documentaries on shark finning. And what shark finning is, like I've shown pictures of people catching sharks and, uh, you know, using them for meat. Shark finning is actually just cutting the fins off of a shark and throwing it back into the water because the only valuable thing, the thing that gets the most amount of money is the fins. So it's not worth it to keep the rest of the shark on the boat that has no value versus being able to add additional fins to the boat which have a lot of monetary value and depending on species as well. A lot of the times the shark isn't actually dead but it's thrown back into the water. And as I said before, some sharks need to be swimming in order to breathe. So sharks actually will die from lack of oxygen and in the event of them dying a slow death by basically asphyxiating. They create an anoxic zone. So anything that goes to eat the shark, that oxygen has been like, depleted in the area, will actually create a death zone that shark is not even in the water for anything else in the water column. So shark pinning is a huge problem. Uh, generally, China is the one that pushes the market for shark pin soup, Southeast Asia. But it's very important to know the United States has also been very slow in stepping up to the problem that is shark finning. So intending to ban the practice of shark finning, the United States passed the Shark Finning Prohibition Act in 2000. Two years later, the act sought its first legal challenge with 64,695 pounds of shark fin. 2008, the Federal Appeals Court ruled the loophole in the law that allowed non-fishing vessels to purchase shark fins from fishing vessels while at the high seas. So a United States vessel brought 64,000 pounds of shark fin legally into the United States because it picked up the shark fins out at sea. It didn't catch it, it didn't actually do the fin itself, but it was able to purchase it from another vessel in another country off sea and bring it in. So finding 64,000 pounds of shark fins happened in 2000 and 2002 in the United States. Now the United States has done a lot more about making laws regarding the proportion of shark fins to shark body mass that's being brought in on fishing vessels. And that's helped lower the amounts of just finning practices in the United States. The first country to actually protect any shark was South Africa. And protected the great white shark. There is not a uniform protected guide for sharks at all. It's very much country to country and sites, the convention of here it is, Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species, it can say what animals are endangered and what is near endangered and what is threatened, but that doesn't impose a regulation unless the countries that have signed the treaty have agreed to the regulations. Japan and China have not agreed to regulations regarding sharks or the amount of catch that happens. The United States has, but again, the sharks that are on those lists are very low. But based on their like, research, the list of endangered species names 64 species, one third of all oceanic shark species, at being at risk of extinction due to fishing and shark finning. So when you when I went down and began to do this research and found out just the amount of loss of a predator, of a very high up in the ecosystem regulating factor, it, I mean, the statistics are unreal. And this is reported catch. 
this isn't what is a roof builder. And there's no, it's very hard to get any management for fisheries to actually say this is the shark numbers, this is how many we have. I mean, Catholic sharks is incredibly hard, and the resources just aren't there to do it. Uh, China, by far the world's largest shark market, in Japan, again, have not signed anything regarding the protection of shark species. And you can look up sites. You can look up every single species ranking in the world. So the whale shark is listed as vulnerable. Um, after that, it becomes endangered, and after that, it becomes critically endangered. So you can actually go in and look up any species that you're curious about. What's its ranking? Where does it actually stand? But again, enforcement only happens if the country has signed the agreement. I do want to I do want to discuss the great white shark that died just after three days in the aquarium. How many of you heard about that? That yeah, was pretty big news. I uh, I got a lot of messages on Facebook about how could the aquarium do this, and sensationalism in conservation groups is a problem. And you know, you're trying your best to save these species, but you're also trying to get the right information out there as a researcher and a scientist. And what happened with that great white shark is it was actually caught by the Yomitong Fishing Corporation. The Yomitong Fishing Corporation said, we have a great white shark, who wants to buy it? The aquarium said, um, yeah, we'll buy a great white shark. They weren't trying to get the fishing corporation to catch them a shark. They just, all of a sudden there was a shark, and out of all the places it could have gone, the aquarium is probably the best because they have the research staff there. They actually have a caretaker for the sharks. They have the medicine that would be necessary to, I think, assist in rebuilding the shark that has just been caught. The problem with great white sharks is they are, they are very, very hard to keep in captivity, and they have to be caught properly. Now, just going out and catching a great white shark, if it was caught in a net, it's not going to survive. So again, it's not knowing how the shark was caught and then sold. That's a big problem. When a great white shark is caught, it has to be by hook and line, and it has to be a very short session. It has to be a very specific place that the shark is caught, and then it instantly has to be put into an oxygenated bath because it immediately starts releasing lactic acid, which is a muscle after that, it has to be doused with antibiotics. I cannot say that that is what happened. Obviously, someone caught a shark, got excited, so we had this wild great white shark who's going to offer some of something for it. So the aquarium took it, and three days later, they no longer had it. But they also didn't have anywhere to put the great white shark. Many, many aquarium staff have tried to design perfect tanks for great white sharks and have failed miserably. Even the Monterey Bay Aquarium, the longest it had its great white shark was 28 days, and it stopped eating. So they released it, and then three days later, it popped tight and was dead. So this is them designing a tank just for great white sharks. And they couldn't just throw the great white shark in with the dolphins and the whale sharks, so they had to put it in their aggressive shark tank, thinking that they could escape the game. Like, okay, great. The great, nothing in here is going to eat the great white shark. And the great white shark, everything's a little bit too big for it, so probably won't eat it as well. <laughs> the stage at which they found the great white shark, too, is eight feet, which is when it's making its transition from eating fish to marine mammals. So it's already had a really kind of interesting transformation, which is probably why it was cruising through the now waters. I saw a lot of divers and sh divers for sharks and save our seas and just blasting the aquarium, but the aquarium has always run those behind the scenes shark programs. I mean, it's been very upfront with their research and their methods. And out of everyone to get it, at least the shark died at the aquarium, that's research. That's an autopsy, that's data, that's genetics, that's finding out why these sharks cruise through this area, how long they're there, and at least to some extent when they be able to see what the actual cause of death was. But it was not something, the aquarium was really misrepresented in the way that they quoted the director by saying, Oh, well, we got it from here, and we always wanted a great white shark. Yes, of course, everyone wants a great white shark, but they weren't prepared for it. It just happened to be took the shark as best they could. Any questions? <laughs>
the photo with the sharks laid out? Was that in UNA? Yeah. That was actually in uh, Oman, in Diba. We have a fish market out there, and that was an like, end of day catch. I know they highlighted China and Japan for the shark fins too, but even for U of A, are they doing the same thing? They you know, they sell to China for the most part. Um, all of their stuff is exporting the shark fins. They don't actually eat the sharks there. Like the fishermen that caught those sharks, yes, they're actually eating shark meat and using it for meals, but the big export out they're one of the third countries in the world that export shark fins. Students, they hadn't been named 
had it been identified this is just this family you don't know what it is never seen it before but we're working on it but here you go kids so it was really cool that the kids actually got to see an animal that hadn't been identified like really just said it's spook fish a species named Henry. yes in your professional opinion, what is your tip on the species of polar bear? Because I've heard bull sharks and I've heard black bull It's not a bull shark. <laughs> well, I kind of knew that, but there are some people that are very adamant with bull sharks. Um, no, it's not a bull shark. Uh, <laughs> bull sharks look like tanks. Yeah. Like, they're hovercrafts. They're, they're insane. They're all snout, pectoral things. They're, these guys, I honestly, I've always gone with gray. Gray like shark? Yep. Pretty much always gone with predator shark. Uh, but that being said, I know that we occasionally get the Galapagos shark out here. That's been sighted up at Cato, and Chuck's seen that, and Chuck's been pretty spot on with his IDs. Um, and those are semi aggressive, correct? <laughs> when diving with sharks, I know a lot of people, when we see a shark at toilet bowl, we all head out. Like it's, you want to go see a shark, you want to go dive with a shark. And that's great. Uh, I definitely don't recommend approaching. Generally, the reason that they're at toilet bowl is those fishermen all fish there. And so you know that that's a quick, deep drift, can pick up something to eat, hang out. Sharks are predictable, but they're not territorial. Like, no shark is defending a territory. This is not, they're not building a nest. That's, that's not how it works. They're cruisers. They move through an area, or they'll stay in an area for a time if there's enough food in easy for them to do so. But, again, if a shark feels threatened, it has one reaction. Like it has one really solid defense mechanism that works incredibly well. They're very pointy. And out of all the people I've worked with who have worked with sharks, the only person I've ever met to be bit by a shark was bit by a black tip reef shark, <laughs> which is generally considered the fun, easy shark to dive with. And he was just at a safety stop, just hanging out, and the shark just came up, hit the side of his rib cage, and left. So it was just one of those, he was like, what are you doing? Who are you? I've never seen you before. Welcome to the neighborhood, and left. So again, it's always caution with any wild animal, and particularly diving out here. When out at toilet bowl, hug the wall, stay at their level, do not go above. When you go to surface on a boat and there's a shark in the water, surface under the boat and then head out. Like anything you can do to minimize your shadow, anything you can do to minimize your silhouette is ideal, particularly if a shark is hunting. Yes? Do you think these are the same sharks that are turning to the pool all the time, or is it like different ones coming through? I think they'll stay through an area, but again, it's hard to say because they haven't been like tied, they haven't been ID'd, and the pictures that we get, yes, they're close, but you know, there's no real way to know if it's the same group. I do think that it's been really consistent over the last few years to see them come at the same time of year, and that's, you know, that's interesting, particularly doing all the bull shark stuff and realizing that they return to an area that they associate with. So. Yes. Ears shark? The one with the worst reputation is probably the bull shark. Um, great white sharks do a lot of damage if they bite you, so they don't have a very good reputation either. Tiger sharks are the scavenger of the sea, so they don't eat anything. But those are kind of the three big ones that we most associate with. But the make is pretty tough too, we think they don't have to them very often. What about the jaguar shark? I once saw a movie and uh, his dad's best friend was eaten by one and then he went on an eight day binge and then set out to find the shark that killed his friend. But it looked pretty deep in the in the movie. But did he the actually kill him? I can't remember the end of after I go back and After the dream sequence he decides not to kill the Jaguar shark. He likes it just That's go. Not it. There's something about a jaguar shark. Uh, the leopard shark's pretty cool, but the jaguar shark is uh, an awesome, part of an awesome movie, though. Uh, how many of you have seen Life Aquatic? 
solid note on that movie. That's actually what Jacques Cousteau did to his interns. That whole hat thing and having them get thrown over to get the anchor, that's all real. So as funny as that movie is, that's very much how Jacques Cousteau was and the things that he made his interns do. Like, if they lost an anchor, he would make an intern go down and get it and bring an anchor back up and not freeze any water. And he, again, had everyone wear the same outfits. It's, it's worth watching that movie because keeping in mind that it's making fun of stuff that actually happened. Yes? Do you find it at all alarming that we only see sharks occasionally in a toilet bowl and there's no like, natural population keeping other things which have the long reads here? Yes. Uh, particularly, this island, one of the things about Okinawa and the mainland is that so much of the coast has been altered that any shark species that would have come from here have moved out to other islands where the actual like ecosystem is relatively similar but actually stays natural the same. It's really concerning how easy it is to see sharks out of the dramas and how to only get a few sightings here in mainland and only temporarily. It's, there's been a lot of changes to this coastline that I don't think have been addressed properly and haven't really been accounted for. Yes? How did you get interested in sharks? Um, I, I saw The Little Mermaid when I was four, <laughs> and I decided I needed to breathe underwater. And they told me I could be a marine biologist, and I said, yeah, I'll do that. And when... <laughs> When you start going to college and you decide you want to be a marine biologist, they weed it out really fast who's just there to work with sea world animals and who actually <laughs> wants a degree in science. And thankfully, when I took an ichthyology course, which is the study of fish, sharks are evolutionarily just brilliant and amazing animals. And so I started to really like them then. And then when I went down to South Africa and got to work with sharks there, it was really cool to actually see great white sharks and be right next to them this you know this fear from diving i've been been diving 12 years at this point which you know, isn't so long compared to other people in this room but when i started diving it was in santa barbara and i would do lobster diving because i was a poor college student and lobster sounded delicious <laughs> and i started to run into sharks a lot because with lobster diving you're more successful if you go at night so I would go out with a red light and at night and sharks would always come up and check out my lights. And at first it was very startling, and then you realize they're just seeing what you are and what you're doing. And after that, being able to go down to South Africa and work with sharks and seeing that it's species-wise across the board the same. They're just, they're generally curious or they want absolutely nothing to do with you. I mean, they're really, really interesting animals. Yes? With sharks, how do they communicate? Um, actually, sharks communicate using body positioning, which I know is kind of strange to think of, but there is a free diver who dives with sharks in South Africa, and you can actually go down to South Africa and get a PADI certification for free diving with great white sharks, as safe as that sounds. And But it's all body positioning in the water column, and the sharks respond and actually can see the position he's making and respond to calm down, let it go. And when they're doing, a, he went out with them while they were feeding on a bloated whale carcass. And the sharks use body positioning to get in line and take turns feeding on the bloated whale carcass. So it, sharks can actually communicate to a degree and it's again body positioning and interactions that they can they can't see somebody mirroring them and respond. And that documentary is well worth looking up to. It's something for you to watch on YouTube. I think it's called like Legends, Living Legends. Yes? Does it shy shy Um, there's actually a few shy sharks. They're all in that same family, but they do the same thing where they turn into a donut. When I picked up the puff adder shy shark, that one's used to me. And that's why he fought me, is because we've already had school groups come in, and he already knew the drill, and he just didn't want to be 
picked up anymore. So it's really interesting like when you go to handle the shark, which ones are going to give you a hard time, which ones are so nervous because they haven't been handled and crawled into a ball. Yes? Uh, what kind of effects would the extinction of shark populations have on the ecosystem? What kind of effects would extinction of shark populations have? It would wipe out your apex predator is designed to keep secondary predators in line, and those secondary predators are designed to keep uh, your like, omnivores in line and following that, your herbivores, and so on down. And when you knock out an apex predator, you're basically tearing apart the food chain because without regulating that secondary level, they're going to overeat the bottom levels, and you can actually wipe out the entire population. Uh, there's a theory, it's called keystone species. And it's looking at things like the sea otter. And when they removed the sea otter off the kelp beds in California due to overhunting, it actually caused the sea urchin population to explode. And those sea urchins ate all the kelp. And without kelp, none of the fish could survive. They had nowhere to forage and nowhere to hide. That's very much what would happen if you took an apex predator out, is you would lose the ability to regulate something more on the bottom that would then overeat the entire coral system, then you no longer have places for fish to forage, and then you're wiping out the entire fish population as well. It's, it's pretty mind-boggling, like, how it would change. Like, it would wipe out species. Yes? Didn't you say the shark was, the flesh was not so deep because of the plastics, yes? Yeah, bioaccumulation from mercury, too. So, just an educational program out there about the, that inside of shark fins be good, or have you tried that? Or? Well, the shark fins is status. It's a symbol that, okay, I don't even, I killed this big predator, I don't even need the rest of the body, all I need is a few fins to put in a soup. And they, Gordon Ramsay actually tried it, tried shark fin soup, and it tastes like broth. It's just a really bland based broth with thin in it. There's no additional flavor and there's no additional texture, but it's showing like how much that thin costs is what adds to the allure, the I need to have this. I need to have this at my wedding with 500 people in attendance and every single person needs the shark thin soup. That's, that's where the problem is, is that just crazy demand for something that has no nutritional value, has no taste and you get rid of the rest of the shark because all you want is the fins. They're not going to get enough mercury from those fins to deter them from eating meat because they're not really eating any of the actual shark.
middle of the season to go out to the Bird River, do that, and again help with the additional projects that they've built out. Yes. Is it the visibility in that video was one meter? So is that typical for that area, or was that just a bad day? That was a bad day. Um, but again, we're so spoiled here in Okinawa <laughs> with visibility. I mean. I've done shore dives in California where I could do this and see my hand and then do this and it's gone. So that, that does happen. Um, that's miserable diving. But out there, a good, with a kelp forest, a good visibility day is 30 to 60 feet. That's, 60 feet is, is unreal. That's spectacular photo, photo taking kind of day. Yeah, I used to catch them by hand. All the sharks we had in our tank, we caught by hand. Um, where we released all the sharks, we would actually hang off the edge there with squid bags, and we would just lure the sharks up and then grab them. No, they thrash a little bit. The only injury I've ever gotten from a shark is because their skin is so tough and covered in those teeth, you'll get a sh like a shark rash, which actually is like someone just scratched you with sandpaper. <laughs> that's that's a shark injury. shark dive in Yomiton is that it's not affiliated with the aquarium at all and originally the aquarium has sit nets all over the island and when you go to the aquarium it is worth noticing that every single animal they have comes from around here the only animals that they've had brought in were the manatees which were a gift from another aquarium and the dolphins that do the show which was actually by request by one of the commanding generals here on Okinawa the United States Personnel asked the founder of the aquarium why they didn't have dolphins. And so he's like, I don't know. And then they got dolphins. So that would that would be on the United States for that. <laughs> so that's fun. But the aquarium originally had the sit net, was one of their operating nets off of Yomiton. And what they use that for is any animal that they catch has time to recover before being transported to the aquarium, or if they're transferring an animal out has time to readjust to the ocean temperatures and systems before being moved out. And they have a lot of those sit nets around the island in a lot of different places. The whale shark one used to be one of theirs back in 2002, but after a year of running the program through there, they disassociated with it and instead left the whale sharks to uh, the business that was helping them run it. But there's no research that comes out of it. There's there's no medical team or veterinary team that visits the site. Uh, as far as I'm aware, and the aquarium has absolutely no affiliation with it. They said, all right, we're, we're done with the whale sharks. You guys can release them, and it's going to happen. Uh, it's not a dive I've ever done. I always recommend going out to the Karamas, taking your luck with seeing a shark out in the wild. I also highly recommend going to Yonaguni. It's a incredible opportunity, and I was lucky enough to go out with Doug one of the seasons before I left, and I had a great time. And it's, you can actually see a remarkable occurrence underwater happening, nat like happening naturally. So that's kind of my take on it. I do understand the business aspects of it, and again, as long as the animal isn't being killed, you'd rather keep an animal alive for ecotourism than you know, see it being sold for a Taiwanese cookbook or something. So, pros and cons. Yes. The, I can't imagine the enclosure is large enough, large enough for it to, for them to feed naturally. Are they are they fed on a regular basis, or is it just kind of like a? You can see that they were starving. You find that they were. From they're the they're not. Kind of suspicious. To them. Yeah, uh, the whale sharks are not fed naturally. They are fed by people. Oh, okay. Are rotated out, or I mean, no. who, who owns them? I mean, they just like catch them, and then it's a it is a business that owns it, and then Tori operates with the business to run tours for America. Can't be the same whale sharks that were there, say, last year. You know, they got no like, because that one died. Okay, yeah, see there. I mean, whale sharks cruise through the area. Sketchy. <laughs> they 
Uh, one of the nice things about that elasmobarian symposium, the filter feeding, is that they actually had whale shark scientists come in and show their findings. And there's actually a, they tagged a bunch of whale sharks in Taiwan. This was a Taiwanese university. Tagged a bunch of whale sharks. They released them, and some of them cruised by Okinawa. Like, weirdly enough, I mean, granted, most of them don't. They head down to the Philippines or kind of continue down to Malaysia, but oddly enough, there's usually one or two that, that curve up here. So there are whale sharks that cruise through this area. It is infrequent. It's not something that you could say, okay, this is the month, like you can at Yonaguni, where you're like, oh, you're gonna likely see a group of hammerheads cruising by. You can't do that with the whale sharks here, but they will, you know, it is part of their kind of, they're not a whale, so it's not really a migratory <laughs> pattern, it's more of a, I'm going to go this way and bulldoze through <laughs> zooplankton, or I'm going to go this way and bulldoze through zooplankton. So there's not really, not really a standard for when they'll see them, but all the ones from the aquarium have been caught locally, and they do cycle through them at the aquarium, but again, trying to develop that breeding program, they've kept one of the larger ones in there for a longer time, and you can really see it... Uh, with the introduction of the dolphins <laughs> into the tank as the dolphins chew on the whale shark's tail because they're bored <laughs> and everything's slower than them, so they mess with everything. <laughs> and the whale sharks, they've actually bandaged up their tails to prevent the dolphins from <laughs> continually harassing them. So, but uh, again, I haven't done the whale shark dive. I don't know how often they're fed. I hear very conflicting information regarding everything and it's it's interesting but again it has nothing there's no research affiliation there's no aquarium affiliation that's that's all completely has been a lie since 2002. Do you know how big a baby whale shark is? Actually <laughs> so that whale shark that they caught in Taiwan had four living uh, babies when they opened up the mother and three of them died very quickly and one was sold to a Japanese businessman for an incredible amount of money. And the one picture the Japanese businessman sent had a picture of a um, puffer fish in a tank next to the baby whale shark. And it is a miniature whale shark <laughs> that was about this big and was in a fish tank. And that's the only picture we ever sent of it. So no way of knowing. That didn't go to science. That went to the businessman who paid to have a baby whale shark in his tank in in Japan. So, but yes, they're actually miniature whale sharks are puffer fish size small. And the reason that they're not seen is they go to depth because they're small enough to get eaten very quickly. So they all go down to depth where they continue to grow in size until they finally come back up and start skimming and surface feeding once they're large enough. Mm -hmm. Yes? What part does, um, what part does shy, sh shy shark That's a really good question. What part do shy sharks play in a food web or a food chain? They are crustacean eaters. They super like their crabs and they super like their clams and some basic mollusks, but they're grinders. So they actually go around the bottom, will catch things and then grind up the shells and eat the food. And they kind of keep that level of animal on the lower side, but they live really in the kelp forest. They stay there. And it's really interesting because in the kelp beds, you can do this and sometimes there'll be a bunch of little babies all next to each other that just like poke their heads up and then disappear. Very cool. Very good question. Uh, um, actually, it's a lot of like history study, but the immature matures kind of easier to answer, and that's calcification of the claspers on the male. When I pointed out the shark and it had those two extra appendages, those two fins, you can actually touch those and feel how flexible they are, and that tells you how far along they are in their maturity level. And when they're hard, they're mature. No <laughs> <Go> figure. <laughs> Yes. A lot of times it's misidentification. 
The two largest sites in the world for great white sharks are the Farallons, which are located off the coast of San Francisco and uh, South Africa, uh, the coast of South Africa. And what they find out is when they've done tests with sharks and put a fake person out on a surfboard, the sharks only misidentify that once, and then they never misidentify it again. So again, when a shark actually attacks a surfer, a lot of the times it's that silhouette. And sea lions are faster than sharks. They're more agile, they're smarter, they're quicker. So a shark has to instantly make a decision to attack within a time frame or it will be unsuccessful. It does not, it loses the element of surprise. A sea lion cannot run a shark. It cannot maneuver a shark, it cannot think a shark. So if a shark sees a silhouette, it has within a 10 second window to figure out if it's going to attack or not. That misidentity happens within that, with making a decision, going for it, and then realizing on the bite that what it bit into was not what it was expecting and it's not worth it to finish the kill. Uh, we're metabolically not worth it. We're like eating celery. Sharks, <laughs> a large shark would actually lose caloric value by trying to eat us. So that's why a lot of the time with great white sharks, they bite and let go because we're not worth eating. They have sensors on their gum line that can actually tell the fat concentration of what they're eating and that helps them assess how long they have between meals and if it's worth it to actually eat something. Yeah? How many question marks are there? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't have to do all of them. <laughs> um, I, yes? Uh, actually, it has a lot to do with that food concept, like being the biggest game in a, in a small pond is, is really nice. And it, their ability to see in unclear conditions, like rivers are really, really brackish. They're dark, they're gloomy. Bull sharks have really strong electromagnetic receptors, so they can sense heartbeats very, very effectively, which makes them a very good predator in low visibility conditions and their eyesight's also incredibly good. That's why bull sharks are so unmistakable. It's that hovercraft head and it's because they have so many additional ampullae of Lorenzini that conduct like their electroreceptors that they can pinpoint where a heartbeat is and how far and it's why they're so effective at hunting. Are they the only ones that exhibit that behavior? They're not the only shark that goes into fresh water now. There's I want to say three or four other species, but off the top of my head, I can't remember their names. They're smaller, less scary, don't get as much attention. Anytime there's an attack in a river, everyone assumes that it's a bull shark, but that's it's not true. I know uh, you guys wanted some time to actually jive and meet everybody, so I want to thank you all for coming tonight and giving up a little bit of your Friday and for letting me come and present. Toilet bowl on island, absolutely. Off island, Yona Guni. <laughs> if, <laughs> if I could get there every day, I, <laughs> I would. This is a really cool dive. GoPros, for the most part. I have, I work with a lot of kids, so I have some basic camera equipment that kids can use that pretty much if it floods, I'm not out a ton of money. So, but it's all really basic, but it just gives kids the opportunity to work with basic camera equipment in the water. It's a really good way of networking and bringing people together on island with similarities and interests, but also being able to create a community. I mean, so much of our lives are kind of base focused. That's really nice to have something that's actually more island focused and about a part of the island that is very, very unique to just being here.